Um, and the two people I'd first like to introduce is uh, Fleur Newman and uh, Sarah Simon, who are going to take us through what is this ACE hub of which we speak. <laughs> Thank you so much, Solly, and thank you to everyone. Um, I heard you say at the end of the last session uh, about how grateful, well, that, that it was, people are grateful that um, in this very busy climate week that you're taking time to be with us today. So thank you very much to everyone who's here, and thank you, Solly, for the opportunity for us to bring this to Solutions House, because we do think it is a solution. My name is Flo Newman. I lead the Action Empowerment Unit at the Climate Change Secretariat. And I'm going to talk us through what that actually means. And we're going to have a conversation with uh, Sarah Simon, who we are in partnership with on the current ACE Hub. So if I can have the slides, um, because we have a few. Um, next uh, Next one. Yep. Um, thank you. So I wanted to start where we start um, on why we're, we're talking about action for climate empowerment. And in the convention um, the, on climate change, it talks about anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And in that word, anthropogenic, it says a lot. It's created by people or caused by human activity. And so the answer to this is people. And the science is telling us that we need rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society to coexist with climate change and avoid its worst consequences. And our choices, the choices of people, and our actions implemented in this decade will have impacts now and for thousands of years. This is a, it's not very um, clear, but this is from the 1.5 degree report. And it's talking about this economic, environmental, technical, institutional, social, cultural, and geophysical feasibility of what it takes to get us to 1.5 degree. But at the heart of all of those things is human action, inaction, decisions, and choices. I'm a lawyer by training. And so for me, uh, looking at the convention, when I look at the fact that Article 6 comes where it comes in the convention, before the establishment of the governing body that has uh, considered this issue for the last 30 years, this is how important the architects of the convention felt education and public awareness, training, public access to information, participation, and international cooperation were in order for us to deliver on the commitments and the goals and objectives of the convention and subsequently the Paris Agreement. So Article 6 of the convention, Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, it deals with climate education and public awareness, training, public participation, public access to information, and international cooperation on all of those things. And children and youth are a cross-cutting focus. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about action for climate empowerment. It, this is a toolbox for delivering on the Paris Agreement. And we have uh, a, an amazing partnership with uh, the government of North Rhine-Westphalia where our um, organization, uh, the UN Climate Change Secretariat, is based. And this hub is, was designed to meet the objectives of the, the Paris Agreement, and it's doing that through three pillars. Uh, ACE focal points at a national level, children and youth, and multi-stakeholder collaboration. And so I wanted to, uh, we, I have Sarah Simon with us, which is fantastic, um, to talk about you know, what was the motivation for, because um, often at, a, at, at the Secretariat, we're dealing with national governments. We also deal with lots of other um, actors. But this was, um, is a, a unique partnership with a subnational government. And it would be great to hear from you what it was about 
ACE and the ACE hub that was so important from, uh, from North Rhine-Westphalia's perspective. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, as Fleur said, my name is Zara Simon. I'm working for the North Rhine-Westphalian uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs. And we support the ACE hub since the beginning of 2022. And we are, as a state, also active in the Under Two Coalition for many years now. And we are happy that these two worlds start to meet because we see a lot of common ground when it comes to driving climate action and also when it comes to pushing ambition. And I'm sharing our experiences as a subnational player. Let me first give you a brief insight in my state in Northern Westphalia. We are the biggest state of Germany with about 18 million inhabitants and we are an industrial state. We have a long tradition of coal mining, both hard coal and lignite. And we are, the largest, we are home to the largest cluster of energy intensive industries in Europe. So um, despite this, so that's why we, why we um, are responsible for almost one third of the CO2 emissions of Germany as well. So despite this challenging infrastructure, climate-wise, we are aiming for net zero at 2045, and we have set climate protection targets for 2030 and 2040 as well. And reaching this transformation is quite a challenge. We need to achieve significant emission reductions in our state if we want to reach our climate goals um, in all sectors, and we need to step up implementation rapidly. And when it comes to implementation, states and regions, together with cities and municipalities, are the ones who develop and realize solutions on the ground. We are the ones who drive change and act as a link between local communities and national governments. And that also means that we should be active in community engagement and empowerment. And this links um, the work of our state to the Action for Climate Empowerment Hub. We support the ASAP because we do see the need of wide engagement of all groups of society. We believe that awareness raising and education and know-how on climate action is key for public acceptance. And yeah, public acceptance is key if we really want to make this transformation in our state and also, I guess, in other states uh, a success. We started as a pilot for three years, and um, the first phase ends this December, and we are happy that we will continue to support the ASAP because we um, have benefited from the ASAP in very practical terms. One is the close cooperation with Young Climate Change on a concrete project. Um, the Northern Westphalian city of Bonn is a major location for international organizations. UN Climate Change is one of them, and yeah, having the United Nations in our state is an important locational factor for us. And secondly, we bring together stakeholders from North Rhine Westphalia with international stakeholders. As you said, the ASAP is a platform that provides training material as well as a place where stakeholders can physically meet and work together and um, yeah, yeah, and, and change ideas. And um, an important part for North Rhine Westphalia is also a youth exchange that takes place annually in Bonn. And um, these events are a great opportunity for us as a state to support young people from all over the world and at the same time provide um, an entryway into the work of climate action, of um, UN climate change, and um, to give them a first impression of the work you are doing. And these um, really inspiring events um, are a value in itself and sensitize for the conditions of other regions of the world when it comes to climate action. Yeah. And yeah, finally, um, yet importantly, the ASAP also aims at, enhance, at enhancing multi-stakeholder collaboration. Today's event is one of these events where different stakeholders can meet each other, and so the ASAP is also building bridges um, and exchange ideas amongst people who rarely have the possibility to meet. And th with 
this, we have reached many stakeholders in the last years, um, in ministries, in NGOs, in the private sector, and also amongst the youth. And we are really happy about uh, this cooperation. So we see that there's so much potential to support the, like the ASAP has so much potential to support the transformation we need in order to build net zero societies. And yeah, the last years have shown how a subnational player can work practically together with UN climate change. And for other regions, um, the ASAP might bring added value in a different direction. And I think each region should sort out which of their own activities could be elevated through the ASAP. But there are so many uh, opportunities to expand and yeah, we would be happy if others would also see these opportunities and we are looking forward to the next phase and yeah, we would, we would be delighted if others would join, join in. Let's, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And yes, this is just a little bit of the numbers. So 56 events organized, 26,000 participants engaged, 230 uh, partners mobilized, and 20 knowledge and communications and outreach products developed over that three-year period. And this was a pilot. So what we see is huge potential for uh, expanding the scope, making it more global, uh, creating more opportunity. And um, we are going to, what we thought, rather than just talk about what radical collaboration looks like and, and, um, and speak about uh, where we see the potential, we thought we'd put a panel together that demonstrated that, uh, and, and we have done so. So um, Sarah and I are going to, to leave now and hand over to you, Solly, to bring our panel on to to have a discussion around all the sorts of things that we need to be talking about in order for us to get where we need to get to. Beautiful, thank you so much, Fleur. Thank you so much, Sarah. And at that point, I would love to invite Ruth Townsend to join us online. Hopefully, Ruth will be coming up online in a moment. And if uh, Nimat Kerr, who is the director of the Under Two Coalition and Subnational Governments at the Climate Group, Fatou Jeng, founder of the Clean Earth Gambia and climate advisor to the United Nations Secretary General, and Susie Hicks, Kids Media and Climate Storytelling, Gris 50 Fixer, and Aspen Institute Future Leader, would come up and join us. I believe we're still waiting for Fatou. Am I right about that? Yes, okay, she on her way. So thank you so much for coming and joining us and thank you for being online, um, Ruth. It's wonderful to, um, to have you with us. And in fact, in order to honor the online presence, Ruth, I'm gonna come to you first because this is a panel, I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm setting it for someone else and I'm reading this going, this sounds awesome. This is a panel to highlight how our work can drive transformational change, yes to transformational change, whilst emphasizing the power of radical, inclusive, multi-stakeholder collaboration. Yes to radical, inclusive, multi-stakeholder collaboration. And the benefit that you might see in the ACE Hub in achieving this. So this is a great panel. I'm so honoured that I got to see it. Hooray for Kristen getting her days wrong. So, Ruth, I'm going to come to you first, and it also gives us a chance to check your sound. So, Ruth, can you tell us a little bit around the research that you've done on what is a question that's come up again and again during Solution to the House, which is creating political space for government engagement and the public on climate risks to see whether we can drive meaningful climate action. And I'd love to hear any of your insights on what national governments are doing, how they face their commitments, and any barriers. Thanks so much, Solly. Is my sound working okay? We can hear and see you. Brilliant. Okay. Well, the first thing that I want to say is, despite all the excellent work you've just been hearing about um, in North Rhine-Westphalia, climate empowerment can't be left solely in the hands of civil society or even federal, state or regional governments alone. There are some levers, for example, on taxation, subsidisation and infrastructure, which only national governments can pull. 
So national governments have committed to climate empowerment, to educate and empower the public to be part of adequate responses to climate change, which obviously is quite a big thing when we think about the scale of challenge that we're facing. But those governments are not yet meeting these commitments. So Simon Steele visited us at Chatham House in April. Um, and as part of his speech, Two Years to Save the Planet, he said that more and more people want climate action around the world, but too often and we're seeing it slipping down cabinet agendas. The public can't be passive or uninformed in climate action, even if this enables governments to feel more in control as they set net zero targets and use rhetoric which suggests that everything's in, its ha in hand when we know that it's not. And the reason that the public can't be passive is because behaviour change is essential in reaching climate goals, particularly in developed countries where carbon intensive lifestyles are the norm. So to be part of adequate responses to the crisis we face, the public will need educating on climate risks so they can understand their magnitude, but they also need empowering narratives of change and an enabling environment around them which includes things like taxation, subsidization, and infrastructure. And the stakes are incredibly high. So at this moment of opportunity that we have right now might be passing us by. Recent research from my former employer Ipsos found that policymakers around the world have taught the talk on climate change, but that a lack of action on the problem is leading to apathy in some quarters. And there's a growing feeling of powerlessness, especially among young people. The number who think that their government has a clear plan to tackle climate change has also fallen since 2022. On the other hand, poor or badly imp implemented policies risk public backlash and far-right or popularist capture of the climate action agenda. And unless this is tackled, action from the public might become impossible just when it's most urgent as trust breaks down between citizens and governments and on an understanding of climate issues. So governments need help to manage and reduce the perceived and natural political risk they need examples of first movers and they need international collaboration. Developed countries are where the bulk of lifestyle change needs to happen and they're also where political reticence is strongest. But developing countries also need support in leapfrogging carbon intensive lifestyle aspirations to aim directly at the sort of lower carbon lifestyles that the IPCC finds are likely to increase human well-being. Brilliant. Thank you so very much, Ruth. And also, Ruth, where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Manchester. Wonderful. Well, thank you so very much for geographically placing yourself. Um, and um, I wanna, I'm going to come to Nima and ask you to build on that, because we've just heard about the role of governments and that there's some things that only government can do. And of course, we heard from Sarah about subnational governments and about the incredible power that subnational governments can have. Now, of course, you have incredible experience of working on this in the Under Two Coalition. So you know, how, do we, how do we use radical collaboration at the subnational level? By the way, can I just start by saying our facilitator today is excellent. <laughs> I have to say her energy is infectious. So I must pass on for somebody who's kind of just taken on this, this role. It's just you're doing an excellent job. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> right, here we go. We're, we're upping the energy. Sorry. <laughs> yes, we absolutely are. So I represent uh, the Under Two Coalition, uh, which is a large network of high ambition states, regions, provinces, we've got North Rhine-Westphalia here, we've got Catalonia here in the audience, and it's a network of nearly 200 subnational governments from across 36 countries. Um, and subnational governments play a really crucial role in, in driving community participation. Uh, and I think the reason is uh, because they understand that the climate crisis is about people at the end of the day. I've spent the last few days with a really inspiring group, of nearly 30 governments that have joined us from 12 countries. All here this morning, we were listening to uh, the premier of Western Cape in South Africa. It's a, it's a province in South Africa. Uh, and he was talking about how a few years ago, you all might remember, Cape Town was going through a big water crisis. 
Uh, and you know, sort of, they had they had been told that there's a day zero coming. You're going to be absolutely without water, and they needed to get into action to kind of support their citizens, support their communities. So the point I'm trying to make here is that subnational governments really have their finger on the pulse of how the climate crisis is going to affect communities. What are the opportunities to kind of drive action with community participation? So during that crisis, Western Cape basically got their citizens to really mobilize, accelerate behavior change. They went down from a consumption of 250 liters of water per person per day to less than 50 liters per person per day. That's huge. And brought their water consumption down from 1.3 billion liters a day to less than 500 million liters a day to tackle the crisis. That's huge. Cut to today, the crisis has left, but the behavior change stays. So every year, Western Cape is adding on a population, Cape Town is adding on a population of 150,000 people, but the water consumption has still remained less than 1.3 billion. They are now at about 800 million. Uh, a day. But this couldn't have happened if the, the province didn't work closely with their community, with their citizens, educating them, talking to them about the crisis, uh, and kind of compelling that behavior change. Yeah. The second example I want to give, and then I'll, I'll shut up, uh, is about um, in, in another part of the world, in Brazil. And it involves the world's most popular support, sport, soccer. So the state of Rio de Janeiro uh, basically did a huge survey with their youth. They said, what are the issues or areas that are of interest to you? And five areas came up. Those areas were science and tech, climate change and environmental governance, sport, uh, and a couple of other areas that came around. And they really looked at sport and football and engaging their football clubs as a very important entry point into engaging their youth groups in the state of Rio de Janeiro. So I had the good fortune of meeting the youth ambassador from the state of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil a few months ago, and he told us how they have mobilized millions and millions of youth in the state of Rio de Janeiro by engaging with the football fans and football clubs that they have been uh, uh, you know, sort of playing that sport in. So I just want to kind of this is such uh, you know sort of interesting examples of how everyday issues and agendas uh, can be really good entry points for subnational governments who really understand the culture, the socio-economic context, how climate change is impacting, and how to engage the community and drive that radical collaboration forward. Well, Lema, if I may say, those are two of the most powerful examples that I've heard since I've been here at Climate Week, and what I love about them is that they prove a deep understanding of the citizenship. Mm -hmm. which perhaps you get at the subnational level and the overall level. Mm -hmm. I also greatly approve that you said the word soccer and then went back to referring to it as football, <laughs> which as a Brit, obviously, don't know what they have over I here. I needed to say but soccer because we are... <laughs> I know, I know. We, we, we'll we'll honour the land of which we stand and then we will call it football for the rest. Um, can, can, we, can we welcome Fatou? To, thank you. So thank you so much for coming and joining us for two. We're having a wonderful conversation about the power of radical collaboration at different levels, at the governmental level, at the subnational level, at the kitchen table level. So the work that you've been doing, and Fatou is the founder of Clean Earth Gambia and a climate advisor to the United Nations Secretary General, which I'm so impressed that you do because I'd be terrified doing that. So you are, <laughs> thank you for taking that advisory role. Um, Fatou, could you tell us a little bit about what motivates your work, particularly in this intersectional issues around gender equality, youth leadership, and public awareness on climate action. Um, thank you so much um, to the UNFCCC uh, for the invitation. Um, actually, I was at the back and I was listening to the conversation. Obviously, mommy duties. I have to make sure I'm doing both at the same time. Um, but it's it's quite interesting to obviously. First of all, um, acknowledge the amazing work that I've done um, by all of you. But what actually inspired me to get involved into the youth um, action for climate empowerment and gender advocacy actually started years ago when I was in my elementary school. 
Um, I am a daughter of a farmer, and my father is a farmer, and my mom used to sell vegetables and horticultural activities. So the proceeds my father get from his farm was what my mom used to use to actually sell it so that we can obviously sustain our lives. But coming from a country that is now experiencing the impacts of climate change, ranging from rise in sea level to drought, among others, I saw how it affected my family, and I saw how my mom actually had to stop her activity or her main source of income as a result of the climate crisis. And living in the Gambia, where the majority of our rural population, about 70% of our rural population, depend on agriculture, and in that agricultural workforce, more than 50% of that workforce actually consists women. When you wake up in the Gambia as early as 4 to 5 a.m., you see women outside at the market selling their agricultural products and their proceeds. But seeing how climate change actually obviously impacted my family, it got me really inspired and motivated to get involved in the climate activism. And when you look at Africa, you see there was a report that was made by UNICEF that over 200 million hours is spent every single day in the global south by women just to set fetch water. And you know, these amount of time that are spent by women could have been spent into something else more productive to develop themselves, their skill, and all of that. But as a result of the environmental problems that we continue to face, it hinders their growth. It makes it really difficult. So seeing all these things around my environment actually got me inspired in the climate activism space and actually um, created Clean Art Gambia. And we now work on the intersection of gender and climate, youth involvement, and climate education and awareness. And over the years, we've been able to work with several stakeholders, but mainly women and girls, and women farmers. There was a time in the Gambia, that was in 2020, there was a corporation that actually wanted to expand their, obviously, corporal activities, and instead wanted to invade on the lands of women farmers. These were lands that these women farmers were using for over 30 decades. And just one day, a big corporation just wanted to come over and take over what they were actually you know, used to and what they used for their main source of income. As an organization, we actually, when we're aware of it, we were able to use our influence, especially social media, to actually bring to the attention of people about what was happening to the women farmers in Gunjur. And that actually spiked so much attention, including politicians, the media, and other people. And a lot of people got involved in the advocacy, and women in Gunjur were able to actually get their farmlands back. But at the end of the day, as a young person that has been involved in the climate space, working on the intersection of gender and climate, we continue to see so many issues that actually affect us. And organizations can't do it alone. As, as, as women or women-led environmental organizations, it's really difficult. For instance, just 1% of global financing actually goes to feminist or women-led environmental organizations or feminist-led organizations. And obviously, we understand that is, that can't do anything. When corporates, when fossil fuel companies are making billions of profits every single day, it's a, it's, it's a challenge for us. So in as much as I continue to be inspired to do the work that I do leading our organization at Clean Art Gambia, there are so many women and girls that continue to be affected. When we see, we see when climate disasters occur, for instance, in the Gambia, in July last year and year before last, hundreds of families were actually displaced during the flooding in July to August and September. Many women and girls were affected, and young girls actually couldn't go to school because of the disasters that were happening. So, Seeing all these things around me continue to inspire me to get involved. But at the end of the day, what we need more is radical collaboration. What we need more is bold action, bold, bolder voices, and more effective and efficient accountability from all of us. We continue to sit in, for instance, the UN General Assembly, we continue to sit at COPs. We have conversations every single time about the same thing, about gender issues, about indigenous representation, about youth participation, among others. But at the end of the day, what matters more is the action that we take on the ground. What matters more is how well we're representing the women and girls and other communities that are affected. At the end of the day, what matters most is that the solutions are implemented. Because if we keep talking, if we, to, if we keep calling for action, 
and there isn't any action, there isn't any meaningful things that are done by our leaders, then we continue to fail. We continue to fail the people that we represent. We continue to fail in our efforts to actually bring in real changes for our communities. So seeing all this actually inspires us to do more. But there is a lot more that needs to be done because we are not even really progressing as far as gender-related issues and youth participation and climate education and awareness is actually concerned, mm -hmm. most especially at the local level where it matters the most. Brilliant. That deserves a round of applause. <laughs> but I'm just going to have to ask one word of clarification because you said a number there that I really, really wish I hope I misheard. You said that less than 1% of global investment, climate investment, is going into women and girls. Did I hear, please tell me I heard that wrong. No, no. Less than <laughs> goes to feminist-led organizations. Feminist-led organizations. Yes. So less than one percent of funding is going to feminist-led. How is that even possible? Like that would be shocking if it was less than ten percent. That'd be shocking if it was less than fifty percent, considering the role of women and girls in climate action. For it to be less than one percent is like it's. Sh it like, I'm struggling to continue on with the panel, what's getting that, that, that. So thank you for sharing that, and we have got to do something to turn that around. But that was absolutely fascinating. And Susie, I'm going to come to you, and I'm slightly disappointed you don't have the puppet. I'm just going to say. fly well. <laughs> she did not fly well. So um, I did get a chance to take a quick look at some of the work that, that Susie does. And, um, you know, my job is talking to people about climate change and climate action. Um, and that can be really challenging when you're talking to a business leader or a CEO or a government minister. <laughs> talking to children about it is particularly hard. Um, but if we're going to radically collaborate, we have to radically collaborate with everybody, including our children. And in fact, in a panel earlier today, um, a young uh, a, a chap who I, I think was about 11 years old stood up and asked about how he could better um, tell this story. Or the part of me is like going, dude, you shouldn't have to, it's our job. But that's another quick point. <laughs> tell us a little bit about your work, how you manage to talk to children about some of these issues. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me here. I've been sitting in the audience for the last couple of days, and I'm thrilled to be up on stage. Um, yeah, I don't work in politics, but I do with, work with another P word, which is puppets. Um, <laughs> and so I'm working on a children's TV program about climate solutions and climate emotions. Um, and so basically my job is who's going to tell the kids and also explain it to me like I'm five because our target audience literally is five. Right. Um, and so I've had an academic interest in children's media and environmental communication since I was an undergrad. And if anyone's familiar with Hayao Miyazaki, I am a massive student of his work because climate change is this big amorphous problem with 80 different arms impacting 80 different places in 80 different ways. And there's a term called ecophobia, uh, which many of you may have experienced. I know I have. Um, and it's really prevalent in children that if you present them with a problem that is so big and has no solutions, they're going to say, I'm all set, actually. Thanks for telling me. I don't want to think about that. Um, and so it's absolutely fascinating to me finding out ways to communicate these global problems that are happening right now and that are going to happen to children in the future in a way that engages them rather than terrifies them. Um, and so I come from a public media background. So I've worked at NPR and PBS, and I still work for the Southern California PBS station. And so I am a massive fan of Sesame Street and of Fred Rogers. And the way that those two shows create uh, atmospheres for learning is actually really radical. It is super rooted in radical academia. And so if you haven't, I would recommend checking out the documentary Street Gang, which is about Sesame Street, and Won't You Be My Neighbor, about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And so the two shows came up in a time when the political landscape was not supportive of civil rights. And through television and puppetry, they were able to radicalize an entire generation of children towards civil rights, ending segregation, and promoting social justice. Um, and the pedagogy of Sesame Street was this new thing called TV is happening, and it's garbage. And it's selling children candy and toys and garbage. What if we sold kids the alphabet in the same way that they're getting sold sugar. Mm. And it completely radicalized the entire landscape of TV. Mm. Um, and with climate change, there's such a gap 
because it's like the talk for parents thinking about climate change with, with kids because they're like, what am I even going to say? Mm. How am I going to talk to them about it? This is going to be mortifying. I don't have all the information. When really, we don't think about educational scaffolding because we're not coming in to talk to kids and be like, Jimmy, it's over. The world is over, and there's nothing we can do you're about gonna it. Die. Yeah, you're going to die. <laughs> have a good day at school. Um, we come in with the age-appropriate learning goals of climate change. And that kind of goes in a sequence of how it was caused, how we got here, what's happening, why it matters, and why it's impacting us, what people are doing about it, and how you can get involved. And the, the main landscape that we're seeing right now is just the second one, or in a little bit of the third one, of what is happening. Hmm. So when they think about talking to climate change for kids, they're like, you're going to show them videos of hurricanes and wildfires, and that's horrible. And I'm not doing that, because A, it's already happening to kids in real life. And so they're experiencing that out in the world. B, that's already saturated in the media landscape. There are enough scary videos out there. Um, and C, I don't want to do that because it's going to disengage my audience. Mm -hmm. And so what we focus on in the work that we do is how we got here, colonialism, fossil fuel infrastructure, exploitation of land and bodies. We can talk about that because kids understand fairness. And they understand when they are being taken advantage of and they don't get to play with the toy, but somebody else does. Um, so that's actually a really easy concept to explain to children. And then we touch on what's happening at Why It Matters, because it's important to know that life is getting harder on Earth for plants and animals. Um, but we really focus on what is being done about it. Because when kids are in kindergarten, first grade, elementary school, they are learning about problems and solutions. The problem is you can't watch TV until you brush your teeth. My dad's in the audience, and that was something that he literally did to me when I was a child. <laughs> What's the solution? You brush your teeth. Um, and so we're talking about that we have this big problem, and we are burning fossil fuels. And we've been doing that for a couple of hundred years. But people have lived sustainably on Earth for hundreds of thousands of years. And so the thing that I really try to ground students in is that it's not humanity that is the problem. We're making a lot of mistakes right now that people hundreds of years ago made, but there's so many solutions. And there are so many people that are helping. Um, Fred Rogers has a quote that says, uh, when I was a kid, I would look at scary things in the news, and my mother would always say, find the helpers. Look for the people who are helping. And so the pedagogy of our show is to introduce kids to local climate role models that are doing the good work. Because not only does it model behavior and help students establish the priority early of climate education and climate awareness, but it also shows career readiness. And it prepares them for a changing work, uh, workforce that they could eventually enter into. And then finally, we talk about how they can get involved. And the thing that just grinds my gears about climate education right now, especially in the US, is that it is very rooted in individual action. Um, because they're like, hey kid, here is this horrifying problem that is happening to the world. And you know what you can do about it? You can make a birdhouse out of a milk carton. <laughs> problem solved. Um, and so for us, our goal with the show and with all of the media that we're making, it is to introduce children to collective action. And, and show them that if you actually get in touch with your community, there are groups that are doing amazing things. Your local library is amazing. The local scientific institutions are tuned in to what's happening with climate change in your area. And you can be a part of that as well. Um, and so that's the pedagogy of the show. Uh, and I have a puppet who has climate anxiety. And so we, uh, we have a bunch of songs about social emotional regulation. Um, and so the first episode is like, what is climate change? And the puppet, who's a sunflower, but she's too little to bloom. So she's, she's still just green. Um, <laughs> she's like, what? What is happening right now? And we have to take a second and chill out and be like, yeah, it's a lot. And then we go, and if anyone's familiar with Grid Alternatives, um, a solar company that does workforce development, we go, and the puppet gets a hard hat, and we go on a roof, and we learn about solar panels. Um, and then we have a song at the end that says, if we use water, wind, earth, and sunlight, we will be all right. Our future is bright. Yeah. Um, and so it's rooted in hope and joy, and the fact that if we come together 
there's so many things that we can do. Um, and that it's not all over. <laughs> it, it, we have so much gorgeous things to do, um, and they're getting on the bandwagon, and they can do it with us. Brilliant, love that. <laughs> Thank you. I think you may have just got a lot more subscribers. So that's I have that's stickers if, if anyone wants stickers. any in my pocket. Okay. <laughs> can, I, can I just check whether we still have Ruth with us? Yes, we do still have Ruth. So we're going to do a very quick fire round and then we're going to bring Fleur back up and get to some questions from the audience. But, um, you know, talking about advertising, I am here to advertise the ACE 2.0 hub. So what I'd love is maybe if in like 30 seconds we could go around and each of us could say, how do we think the ACE 2.0 hub might be able to help us? And Ruth, I'm gonna to come to you first. Um, what's your plug for the 2.0 hub? So we need to play to our strengths in a crisis. Um, and at Chatham House, that means looking to convene governments and experts in safe, neutral spaces to engage with the evidence and develop, de develop solutions that are both scientifically robust and politically feasible. But even if we come up with perfect transition pathways that governments are willing to throw themselves behind, there's still a need for the whole of society effort to implement these. So we hope that the ACE Hub 2.0 can be a gateway to those innovative and sometimes unlikely collaborations needed to bring that transformation about. Brilliant, love that. Nima, ACE 2.0. Um, the climate crisis is intricate, it's complex. It needs everybody to work together. AS 2.0 can be that entry point into just kind of driving everyone to work together because there are solutions. There is immense intellectual wealth that exists in the world and we need to be able to create platforms to share it and AS 2.0 can be that. Brilliant, thank you so much. Susie? Yeah, I think the more people that know about stuff is the more people that care about stuff. And by cross-sectorally collaborating, we're able to share these messages with people that are not doing the same thing that we are doing, and that is so helpful for getting out of our echo chambers or getting out of our industry silos and really sharing these stories that are so important. Love it, Fatou. Yes, I just wanted to say we all will acknowledge that knowledge is power and an informed society is a smart and a society that will achieve so many things. And I believe the ACE 2.0 hub will be or should be a, a, a platform where we'll continue to leverage this to share our stories, to inspire each other, and to advance changes in our societies, in our communities, and to also galvanize efforts, synergize efforts, and continue to use platforms like this to hold our leaders accountable, to ensure that there is public leadership, political leadership, and to ensure there is collective effort and a more radical approach. Because for far too long we have been talking, I'll say, but we haven't really been bold enough. So the hub, I believe, could serve as this hub, or it could serve as this platform where we continue to work together to make sure that there is more call to action for more climate empowerment, for more climate education, and for more access to information that will help us to address the climate crisis, the gender crisis, as well as our humanitarian crisis in general. Love that, brilliant. So I have to say, Fleur sitting over there, grinning as she hears all of that. So come on up, Fleur, thank you so much. So it's, it's Hub, Ace Hub 2.0. This time it's for everyone and it's bolder. So, you know, just to use my branding powers to bring it to life. Um, uh, what, what, what do you think of what you've heard yet? And then we're gonna come to some questions from the audience as soon as we can. Okay, keep going. I wanted to demonstrate. Yeah. There we go. Um, what radical collaboration looks like. And I would just like to say thank you. <laughs> you did that brilliantly. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the whole point of this is about how we can create these platforms. As Ruth was saying, and we've been, we're imagining this in the context of having um, strategic collaborators who can help us to convene the unlikely combinations um, creative and technical collaborators who can help us with delivering and doing so around the world. So we've had, um, we, we have had some outreach um, outside of, of uh, or globally, but, but this next phase, we're looking to do that uh, in a 
in a bigger, bolder way. Great. Super. So does anyone have any questions? Or thoughts on the hub? Okay, sir. I wanted to just ask a question about radical collaboration as it pertains to Climate Week. Because this is my first Climate Week, and I know it's very decentralized, which is part of its strength, I think, because people can find their niche and, um, you know, pick and choose. But I'm kind of surprised that there isn't a radical collaboration among all the people who are here for Climate Week. Like, why aren't we mobilizing some sort of, you know, social activism or something here that everybody can participate in at once? Brilliant. And what your thoughts would be on that? Thank you. I just want to check if there's any other questions, just to make sure. Can we maybe take this question over here at the far end as well? And then we'll, we'll, we'll answer both to at the same time to close out our panel. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. This is such an incredible panel. Um, I'm the founder of a climate action platform that helps Gen Z take climate action at scale. Yes. Um, so this is like right up my alley. And it's so critical to me and, and our work that young voices continue to be at the forefront so that we're constantly putting them and prioritizing their needs and really understanding their pain points. Um, what are your sort of recommendations for the best way we can do this as we continue to collaborate and bring people together, making sure that especially young women, young women of color, making sure that understanding their needs, especially in the global south, this is a super intersectional issue and that we continue to make that a priority. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to come to each of you and ask, how do we do radical collaboration at Climate Week when we've got nine hundred events and thousands of people and secondly how particularly can we radically collaborate with youth Ruth I'm going to come to you quickly just this is I'm afraid a 30 second answer um, I think that whole of society effort needs to be there and I think that places like New York Climate Week are such amazing chances to build your network and but they don't stop at the end of the week they carry on and it's about using whatever you have in your toolbox to take forward and continue those connections and build on them over the coming year. I think that's spot on. Climate Week is psychotic. By the end of it, you have no brain left. So just <laughs> gather it all up and then continuing it. Every week is Climate Week. Mm -hmm. Every week is Climate Week. Nima. So I actually work at Climate Group, which is the organizer of Climate Week. Yes, you so, to this. Yes, <laughs> let's, let's talk. <laughs> but I would absolutely echo Ruth. So the, the whole idea behind Climate Week is to bring us all together, uh, to sow the seeds of collaboration that we all take back home. We engage our local governments, we engage our sub-national governments, we engage community groups. It's very important to kind of continue the energy that we are feeling in the room today throughout the week and take it back home uh, and solve this global crisis. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Susie, particularly the question about youth, perhaps. <laughs> Absolutely. To answer your question, I'm a young person looking for funding, so I'll talk to anyone everywhere and just <laughs> no matter what they're doing, and Jess in the audience can agree. Um, to sp specifically address your question, um, I was in a fraternity in college, which doesn't sound relevant, but some consultant woman came to our group once and said, people don't join groups, they join people, and people don't leave groups, they leave people. And so for me, the most important part of scaling the work that I do and also keeping the work I do sustainable is community. And so building, maintaining, and cherishing relationships has kept me in this movement. And it's the friendships that I have. It's the people who also don't have any power but are like, you got this, man. You know, it's the late night um, diner sessions after the important climate week events that keep me going. And so especially in Gen Z, I used to run an online platform for 14 to 25 year olds um, engaging in ocean climate action. And it wasn't the professional development panels. It wasn't the resources. It wasn't the job opportunities. It was the people that they were meeting. And it was the ability to say, you've got a really good idea. And I believe in you. And I know that there are people that want to help you and support you. So community relationship building. Brilliant. Fatou. Just wanted to quickly add um, um, to what has been, has been shared already. Yes. Um, there isn't that much collaboration here um, because again New York Climate Week is just it's just a week and then you go to Africa Climate Week it's not a week you go to COP it's two weeks there's there's so many things that are happening at the same time but what I've observed here at the Climate Week is the fact that yes in the General Assembly Hall we have presidents giving their statements you go to side events, you see civil society and other groups having conversations. You step outside, you see people protesting 
So there are so many things that are happening, people making so many impacts in different ways. But just wanted to bring, I mean, just wanted to share this, that if we take a look at the conversations and in the rooms that we are in, do you see as many indigenous people as there should be? Do you see as many young people as there should be, especially young people from Africa and the global south? Do you see as many women as we should? When you look at the General Assembly and the statements that were given, you could count the number of women that were there as speakers. Quite disheartening, I'll say. So for us to make sure there is more radical collaborations in weeks like this, we need to make sure we are bringing the right people that matter, the right people that need to speak for themselves and to stop tokenizing people because that has been happening for quite a long time. So for us to make sure we are achieving that radical collaboration, we need to make sure we are bringing the people that are most affected, the people that are leading solutions on the ground, and the people that are mobilizing, educating, and campaigning against what is happening. And if we do that, that way we are able to make sure we are building a radical collaboration for climate education and public awareness and involvement. Woo. Brilliant. Thank you. And Fleur, 10 seconds to close us out. Final pitch for the Hub. Well, I think they've done that for me. <laughs> <laughs> and that question was, was, about, was about it. This is, um, we are, it, it's as big as we can imagine it to be. And, uh, and I want us to imagine big. Is that brilliant? Mm. Awesome. So from, I'm super excited about the climate, um, uh, the ACE hub. Um, ever since I discovered the ACE agenda and Article 12 of the Paris Convention, I go, that's what I do, and it's in the Paris Agreement. Why is this not happening more? The idea of radical collaboration. And of course, radical collaboration, a technology like the hub is only as good as the human beings that get in there and use it. The real hub is inside us all along. So thank you so very much for joining. I'm so pleased I got to do this, this incredible panel, so many insights to take away. Ruth, I know it's probably quite getting on a little bit late in your day, so thank you so much <laughs> for hanging on for us in what looks like your very beautiful flat. Um, so please join me in thanking everybody on this panel for joining us and everybody who's joined us in the room and online. Thank you. Woo!